You're listening to the Celestial Citizen Podcast, and I'm your host, Britt Duffy Adkins. Celestial Citizen is a space media company with embedded urban planning values, looking to help shape a more equitable and just future for all of us in space. This podcast seeks to provide an opportunity for conversation about how to be a better interplanetary citizen and responsible steward of Earth and the cosmos. By engaging the global public, providing greater access to the space industry, and amplifying a more diverse set of voices, progress in space can equate to progress on Earth. We who are bursting with stardust can become celestial citizens. We'll be discussing the upcoming Humans to Mars Summit, which is taking place in person May 17th through the 19th in Washington, D.C. this year, and hopes to further conversations about how we get humans to Mars by the 2030s. People have this inflated perspective. They'll often think that NASA accounts for the same amount as the military, or it's a choice between NASA or Social Security. But it's not that choice because NASA accounts for less than half of 1% of the federal budget. When we become each other's best crewmates here on Spaceship Earth, I think we will have it made being crewmates elsewhere. On today's show, we have two guests joining from Explore Mars, Janet Ivey and Chris Carberry. Janet is the president of Explore Mars and creator and CEO of the award-winning Janet's Planet, which is committed to enriching the lives of children via education and live performances, TV, and online programming. Her first TEDx talk was in 2014 entitled Awe, Art, Wonder, and Experiential Inspired Science. Her second TEDx talk will happen May 3rd at the Weiss School entitled How to Inhabit Your Very Own Planet, hashtag Planet U. She has received 12 regional Emmys, five Gracie Allen Awards for her children's series, Janet's Planet, that airs on 140 plus public television stations nationwide. Most recently, Janet joined the board of directors for Explore Mars. She is also an active NASA JPL solar system ambassador on the board of governors for the National Space Society, recipient of the New World Institute's inaugural Permission to Dream Award in 2016, and has won a STEM Florida Award for Exploring Microgravity, an educational video that she wrote and produced for Space Florida. Her mission is simple, amplify the love of space, science, and exploration, and to encourage this generation that Mars is theirs. Also joining today is Chris Carberry. Chris is the CEO and co-founder of Explore Mars and a well-respected expert and influential director of strategic alliances in the space community, as well as with non-traditional organizations. In recent years, he has overseen Explore Mars' annual Humans to Mars Summit, which we'll be talking more about today. He has also spearheaded dozens of programs, including the Mars Innovation Forum, the annual community workshops for the achievability and sustainability of human exploration of Mars series, the AR, VR, and Space Workshop series, and the Women in Mars Conference in D.C. as well. Chris is also the creator and one of the senior editors of the annual publication known as the Humans to Mars Report that was highlighted in the NASA Transition Authorization Act of 2017. In 2013, Chris was awarded a NASA Group Achievement Award. Chris is also the author of over 100 articles and op-ed pieces that have appeared in numerous publications. Chris is the author of the 2019 book, Alcohol in Space, Past, Present, and Future, and the upcoming book, The Music of Space, to be released in 2022. Both volumes are being adapted into documentary films. Such a pleasure to have you both here, Jana and Chris. Thanks so much for joining. I'm excited to dive into our conversation. Thanks for having us on. Thank you so much. So to kick things off, we always ask this of people that join the show, but how did you both get interested in space and pursuing careers in this industry? So I always love this question 
I can trace my love of space, this moment of genesis in my love of the solar system, back to fifth grade in Miss Ernestine Yarborough. She and Miss Carolyn Davis in their bell bottoms in the fall of 1978 brought a telescope on a Friday night. I'm pretty sure there was probably a basketball game going on at the elementary school, but these ladies had a telescope out on the playground, rural West Tennessee, no light pollution, and I watched two brilliant ladies show me stars and planets and constellations, and I was hooked. So I can really trace my love back to fifth grade. I was 10 years old, and I'm ever grateful for Miss Ernestine Yarborough. Oh, wow. That's such a beautiful story. I love that. And what about you, Chris? When I was in college, I had degrees in poli-sci and history and archival research, and I didn't see how I was going to be able to engage in space exploration, and I worked in these fields for a while. Around the mid-90s, to age myself, I started reading up again, reading various books like The Case for Mars by Robert Zubrin and a number of other books, and I realized that one of the things, while we have a significant number of engineers and scientists, we always need more, Probably the most important thing that we were lacking that really had held us back from actually achieving these goals were policy experts, that it was actually the lack of political willpower that had prevented us from going back to the moon or going on to Mars or anything else. So I realized this was the area that I could get into the space community. And I started off as a volunteer running space policy for groups like well, the Mars Society, I worked, did a lot of work with National Space Society, eventually became the executive director of the Mars Society. And over time, it just turned into my full-time job. And, you know, we founded Floor Mars in 2010. So it's kind of a strange transition from historian policy expert into full-time space exploration professional. Yeah, but, you know, I love that because both of your stories kind of, I think, highlight some of, I guess, the more common channels that we seem to get on this podcast, which is that people either from a very early age just knew that they were super interested in space and very captivated by it, or it was something that sort of came later in life through these non-traditional kind of channels where people kind of found that there was more of a multidisciplinary approach to take to space. So yeah, really interesting backstories there. Thanks for sharing those. So I want to dive in to explore Mars a bit more for people listening that might not already be familiar with this organization. And Chris, you touched on this a little bit already, but how did Explore Mars come to be and what is the overarching goal of the work that you want to do? Well, back in 2010, as I mentioned, we were founded, a group of people, some from other organizations like the Mars Society, but other groups like National Space Society, as well as a number of industry people and NASA people you know, realized we wanted to do some projects. And we, at the time, we weren't even thinking of creating a whole new organization, but we realized to do projects, we probably needed to have a 501c3. We probably needed to formalize it. So that was actually the start of the organization. But at the time, we also did not want to be a membership organization. 2010 was a strange year anyway. It was bad, a very bad economic time. And membership groups, memberships were literally going through the floor. So we figured we didn't want to be just one other space group coming up with members. So we decided to be project oriented. And so we jumped into it with programs like the ISS and Mars Conference and the Women in Mars Conference to start off with. And we found our niche. We filled a hole that was there. People gravitated to us pretty quickly, but we also realized that we were very good at bringing people together, groups that were not necessarily on speaking terms or whatever, that even with ISS and Mars, it sounds like, hey, of course, I have the people on ISS, and we're always talking about this at the time. That was not the case. I literally had to argue with the head of the Mars program at NASA, the, you know, the robotic program, for three hours to tell them that this was a good idea. But we slowly brought everybody together and you know, had them embrace this program that like, if we have ISS, how can we utilize it for Mars? And it was very successful, but that was the model as we went forward. And since then, we've done a lot of different programming, workshops, contests. We've done STEM education, which Janet can mention because it really bloated to a large, much bigger degree when Janet came on as president. And so Janet, actually, if you want to cover that part of the of our programming. I came to my first Humans to Mars Summit, I believe that was around 
probably 2013, 2014, and was so very impressed. I found Explore Mars to be incredibly accessible as far as the people that were involved, that I love kind of their heart and mission about this proposition. And so I very, <laughs> very naively, or maybe very directly, I'm not sure which, I came up to Chris and then Artemis Westenberg, who happened to be president at the time and said, hey, if you need anybody to help you with education, let me know. And they were like, uh, yes, you can go to work anytime you're ready. And so at many of those Human to Mars summits prior to the pandemic, we always had an afternoon of STEM. And during the pandemic, Explore Mars really supported me as we said, hey, who wants to learn something about space? And we were able to serve hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of kids around the globe with great programming. And for me, it is preparing that generation that will actually do the exploring, living, and doing the work on Mars and preparing them now for their inevitable future. I think that was when they asked me to speak one year, that was what I was trying to say most to the audience is that if we're truly, as Gene Roddenberry says, on a journey to keep an appointment with whatever we are, then those of us that have been dreaming these things need to be preparing that STEM pipeline and that workforce. So that's what gets me excited about this proposition of going to Mars is the third, fourth, fifth graders that are sitting somewhere right now will be those first boot prints there. So pretty exciting. Explore Mars and Humans to Mars Summit in particular has a, a special place in my heart because maybe not many of our listeners actually know this, although I'm sure I've said it before somewhere on the podcast, but Humans to Mars was one of the very first space conferences that I went to and just really out of curiosity about it. And it led me to completely kind of pivot my career and just completely dive into the space industry. It obviously had a very lasting impression on me. And, you know, and that's led to where I am today, you know, with this podcast talking about all things space and lots of other fun projects. So I really can't say enough positive things about Humans Tomorrow Summit because it's just an absolutely wonderful event. I strongly encourage people to attend if they're able to, because it really is just like a great few days of really captivating conversations. So much gets discussed, so many different aspects of the future of space exploration. So I'm a big fan, if you couldn't tell. That makes me so happy to hear because when they approached me about becoming president, that's one of the things that I was most excited about. And we've heard this story, not only from you, but from some others who really fell in love and found a path that they hadn't expected by attending our conference. And that's what we want to be about. So if you happen to be listening and you're space curious, and it's something that's sort of out there on the fringes of your interest, but you'd like to dive deeper, we'd love nothing better than to have you at the Human to Mars Summit. We love these stories. And as Janet mentioned, yeah, we've heard so many of them lately. And it is really wonderful to hear that we've had an impact and the event has had that impact. Another great example is just last fall, there was this wonderful analog expedition in the Jordanian desert that Mac Malkawi ran. And he was literally inspired to get into space by our conference also, actually speaking with Janet one year. I don't know, what was it, 2016, Janet? I think it was. And it inspired him to just engage. <laughs> Here was this crazy story. I didn't find out about what, again, you don't go around thinking, oh, like what I just said had such impact. But I would have spoken to Mac in 2016. And the reason that year rings in my memory. It's the year that my mom passed away the second day of the summit. But I had been there all day Tuesday and I had spoken and I'd worked with kids and apparently Mac and I had spoken. And that might have been the year that I was like on it. It's like, you want STEM? You say you want STEM? Then you better go out there and make it happen. Create that workforce. Find somebody to mentor. Don't just stand around talking about it and wishing about it. So apparently he really heard me. So in 2019, somebody says, hey, somebody wants to talk to you. And he starts telling me that I really moved him to action. And I was like, really? What? And he said that he really felt called to 
go and serve and take STEM to Syrian refugee children. So he literally went to the Smithsonian, bought some kind of like kid astronaut outfits and helmets and went to to Syrian refugee camps and took STEM there and space there. It wasn't until really I got home that I kind of like gave a big wink and a big kiss to mom, wherever she is in the whole celestial <laughs> place or out there and just thought, wow, my mom had encouraged me. It's like, you go do what you need to do for the kids. She had just had a surgery. And, you know, it was daunting to hear that my mom had passed. But because she said, you go do what you need to do for the kids. And to realize all of those things that happened in between me finding out that Mac had been inspired by a few things I said that day was really remarkable. Yeah, that's so inspirational to hear. And of course, I'm, you know, very sorry for your loss. And I'm sure that was a really difficult year for you in particular. Yeah, I can imagine that like hearing about how these exchanges can lead to so much positive impact around the world. I mean, it's right. I, I get like chills just hearing you talk about it. Oh, me too. I was, I was blown away. I was like, what? This kid, no, that can't be. But I think sometimes that is the power, right? It's relating your story in such like your passionate way to go, hey guys, it's like you keep talking about this STEM workforce. That would be one of the questions I'd love to really lay out there for the audience. And one of the things we're thinking about is how do we prepare students for their future in space? How do we prepare students for their future on Mars. And then what will education look like on Mars? It'll be machine learning, or they'll be wearing their smart watches that will be measuring their biometric and giving some analysis there so that ship shape or if anything goes wrong, it will mandate on Mars that education there. It's like, what will be most necessary for them to learn immediately to protect themselves in case anything's going wrong? So it brings up some really great possibilities for if we start thinking about what we need to teach on Mars, might it revolutionize how we could kind of do something really transformative in our own education system? I've never really thought about that before, but that's a super interesting point because we often in the space industry talk about how important it is that what we're doing in space has some way of connecting, you know, back to earth and improving the quality of life here. But education, that's such an interesting example of an area that we could look at. And I think that's exciting to think about. You're absolutely spot on that Mars, it's going to have entirely different requirements, but just starting to think about that allow us to be more innovative here. I, I don't know, but certainly seems like a good possibility for sure. You know, the educational element is certainly important and you know, these inspirational areas. I don't think people talk about that. How are we going to translate education to Mars when we're there and how it can kind of help us adapt, you know, lessons here on Earth? But similarly, you know, that's one of the key themes of the Humans to Mars Summit, really of Explore Mars in recent years is connecting it, everything back to Earth, kind of like submissioning your, listening to your mission statement you were reading earlier, seem very much in line with what we've been always pushed, but we've really been advocating in the last four to five years, looking at all of these areas, these innovations that are required for sustainability, and that includes education, but required for sustainability, but also can have an extraordinary beneficial impact here on earth now whether it be looking at particularly these all the innovations you need for sustainability we always get so focused on the transportation the rockets but we always people forget to talk about yeah it's great if we can build a rocket we can get to mars but there's a lot of other things that we need we need to breathe we need to eat we need medicine you know remote medicine and on-site medicine we need artificial intelligence we need to be able to utilize the resources etc 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 and so that really has been woven into all of our discussions lately with some specific programming but always trying to work that in how by looking through the mars lens can we innovate in a way that could have a dramatic impact on earth because we're looking at it in a way that 
nobody would look at it here on Earth, you know, because we have to be, on Mars, you have to be completely efficient. Otherwise, you might die. That's a great motivator. But on Earth, even with the issues that we have on the planet with global warming, et cetera, people still are not motivated. So you have incremental growth. But when you're looking at this really harsh environment, trying to figure it out, that's when you make the major leaps forward that you realize, oh my, we could also apply this to Earth. And it would be just a significant improvement over the status quo and probably be an extraordinary market as well. And so that's another angle that even five years ago, we were having panels on the economics of Mars and people were saying, well, it's probably not there yet. Now I can see maybe we could make a profit on the moon. Now there are literally uh, venture capitalists looking at this, investing at these other areas of it, because I think everybody assumes the transportation is being handled, but now they're looking at all the details and they realize this isn't, doesn't cost billions or millions even at times, sometimes hundreds of thousands or even less. We can develop an essential technology that has that dual use, that benefit Earth, benefit Mars, and be an actual uh, potentially profitable venture at the same time. You know, one of the questions that we get asked often or we will get Facebook messages about is like, you guys, this is never happening. It's too expensive. You should really focus your attention on things that actually matter here on Earth. And it's hard to argue with that. We get it. We look around and we see all kinds of things that are disagreeable to your own soul. And you go, oh, how can we improve things here? But as Chris was saying, if we figure out a way to have a astronaut suit on Mars that somehow is impervious or super protective against radiation, what have we just solved for cancer here on Earth? If we find a way to grow plants in the most harsh environment, literally recycling every possible waste byproduct, et cetera, could we have just solved food scarcity here on Earth? And as we think about telemedicine or robotic avatar, medic is a great example. What might we be learning about personalized or individualized medicine when we won't get a resupply mission to Mars, maybe for you know 26 months at a time? How do we make the most of those resources? So while I understand that argument is like, why worry about this when we've got so many problems here? Everything, I think, always points back to this blue ball where all the good stuff happens. I mean, one of the things, if you ask kids how they're going to, like, what will be necessary for in a Mars habitat, every kid will eventually come to the point that they need a library. They'll want to know the history of where their grandparents or parents came from. And how do we tell that story and then have those Mars stories impact us back on Earth? So that's what I get excited about. I'm hearing you both talk about it and with so much passion behind it as well. Would you say it's fair to say that really the goal of humans to Mars is sort of it's in tandem, right? It's both actually getting humans to Mars, but it's also seems like it's just as important improving the quality of life back here on Earth. Absolutely. And one thing they don't think people also realize, first off, most people who are arguing this don't actually understand the benefits already brought, as well as what it really costs. People always have this inflated view. But one of the things I really like as well, and one of the things that's really driven me, is the power to unify. And even more important now, as we have this really unfortunate international situation right now, and space literally is one of these few things that truly can unite. And we're still working with Russia in space on ISS. It's remarkable, but over the last 10 years, during all these rocky times, it's kind of held us together. But countries just come together to unify for these things. And so many countries are coming together with the Artemis Accords to kind of join us going back to the moon and on to Mars and all these international programs. But even if you go to other countries and ask, talk about space, they look to NASA as though it were their own space agency. Even if they have one, they look at this as not the United States Space Agency, but this is you know, representing the world. So it's a wonderful way of bringing people together, a wonderful diplomatic tool. And to be perfectly honest, here in the United States, exclusively, it's one of the only things right now, the public policy topics that have strong bipartisan and public support. There are very few things you can count. You probably can count them on two fingers, that, you know, things that have such strong 
bipartisan and public support. So it, we just need to do a better job at articulating why not only will this benefit humanity, but how if we got didn't do it, how humanity would probably be far worse off because of all the different benefits this already has brought us and will almost certainly continue. And that will magnify it over time as we're really beginning to literally take off within the space industry. And on this podcast, we really try to reach audiences beyond just those who are already in the space industry. I mean, you guys are doing great because you're actually kind of answering my questions before I even ask them, which is- Why which do we is, need you? Honestly. I know, I, I can just go get a coffee right now, but, <laughs> but you know, one of these things, Chris, that you kind of brought up there, but I do want to just spend a little bit more time on is like people outside the space industry, I think tend to have a lot of misconceptions about Mars or why we're going to Mars. So what do you think people tend to get wrong when thinking about Mars? Probably the biggest misconception pretty much forever is cost. People have this inflated perspective. They'll often think that NASA accounts for the same amount as the military or the choice between NASA or Social Security. And sometimes when you see polls, they're worded in a way that will imply that. I remember being called once and they said, can we afford to go to Mars when we might not be able to pay for Social Security? With the implication, if we go to Mars, you're not, we're not going to pay for Social Security. Of course, if I had the choice, it <laughs> If we can't pay for Social Security or if it's Social Security or Mars, I'm sorry, I'll probably pick Social Security. But it's not that choice because NASA accounts for less than half of 1% of the federal budget. And so we did a poll back in 2013, a scientific poll, and the people taking it didn't know it was being conducted by a Mars group. First question we asked is, what percentage of the federal budget do you believe the NASA budget incorporates? And we only gave them a sliding scale between zero and 5% because we didn't want everything to get skewed with the inevitable 20%, 30%. And so the average answer ended up being 2.5%, which was still more than five times more than what it was. And then we go, gave them the answer. And then we asked the questions. And this was right in the middle of all these budgetary problems back in 2013. So everybody knew that we were having budget issues. And we were nervous because we were doing contingency plans in case, what if they come back with like 20% support? So we were shocked that we had 70% dial, generally 68 to 70% supporting once they knew they had budgetary context. You know, they supported human missions to Mars. They supported doubling the NASA budget from half a percent to a percent. It was just overwhelming support. I think it removes the guilt because people feel guilty when they think, oh, I like this, but is it, can we really afford to pay you this? You know, we might not be able to pay this, that, or the other thing. But when you tell them what it is within the real budgetary context, it changes everything. And even now, even more so because, yep, NASA is still around the same amount, but we also have so many companies at all levels, not just Bezos and Elon Musk, but it's a remarkable number of investors around the world putting their own money in. So this is a remarkable time period. So we have to not only educate the public at the real cost, but why people are investing in this, what they see. This isn't just something so a few billionaires can have fun, you know, for a few minutes. That that part of it, sometimes there is are frivolous things that go on. And this is something looking to the future, like early aviation. Who flew in early aviation? Mostly a bunch of rich people. <laughs> Most people couldn't afford it, but that was necessary. And over time, the market developed, and now everybody can fly in wonderfully comfortable seats <laughs> and pleasant flights. Yeah, we all know. So that's that's generally, I think, the biggest misconception. It's just cost and, and probably secondary, just achievability. But I think people are beginning to see with everything going on that these things are possible now. So I think we're addressing that already. And how can we engage more people in these sorts of gatherings and bringing more voices to conversations about Mars so that we can help to dispel some of these misconceptions? Well, I think to that end, there is an open invitation. And even for those who may be even listening and still are not convinced that Mars is a good destination for humans, 
let's engage in that conversation. Maybe you have some ideas, like what would you do? But when we think about even the MOXIE instrument that's on perseverance that can transform carbon dioxide into oxygen. Now, Dr. Michael Hecht, who is the principal investigator of that project, will tell you, well, it's not exactly made yet for use for maybe earthbound things, but what if it could be. And then you could, from some of our carbon dioxide that we continually put out into uh, our world, what if we could then create a mechanism and using that MOXIE technology, create oxygen here on Earth? So for me, those are exciting propositions. And the reason that it's like we're going there and the rovers are great. It's the only planet to be entirely inhabited by rovers. But what rovers think take months to do, humans might be able to to do in a couple of days and be able to hold it in their hands, describe it and interact. And that to me just gets so amazingly exciting. What we might discover as humans in this grander question of what is the meaning of life? Are we related to other things out there? Why did life not thrive on Mars? And here on Earth, we might find, you know, some weird thing we haven't found yet, but on Mars, it's kind of crystallized and fossilized in moments that we haven't even yet been able to take a good look at. So finding kind of like that connection and the origin of life, continuing to look at meaning and consciousness and how that all applies in this grand experiment of life and exploration, that to me is that pursuit. And that's what gets me excited. That's what gets me excited to talk about it with kids. And you hear people talk about the billionaires going to space and, you know, there were several amazing people who just went up with Axiom Space and, you know, they they actually got delayed coming home because of a storm. But when you start to read their bios, they're all philanthropists who are doing amazing things for kids and education in the communities where they are from. And that's powerful stuff. And as Chris was mentioning, yeah, it's like they are paving the way for eventual prices to drop and for space to be accessible for all of us. And the fact that the astronauts that went up on that Axiom space mission, they had over 25 experiments, and some of them were especially for the kids back home in the communities they serve. And that's what touched me the most. I thought, okay, that's the way to do it. Same thing for Jared Isaacman, whose you know inspiration for mission was all about supporting St. Jude. So I think to honor those moments and those people as well going, yeah, it may be the wealthiest among us going and getting that. But as this commercial space, as that opens up, it powers, it kind of like literally puts fuel in the tank for Mars and further exploration. So I would just invite anyone listening to think about that. And we should note that, of course, on Inspiration4, not everybody who went up was a billionaire. Only one of them was. One of our own board members went up. We certainly not a billionaire. Dr. Cyan Proctor, fourth African-American woman to go into space and the first African-American woman to be a pilot for an orbiting spacecraft. So a tr- truly remarkable mission, which was enabled by a billionaire, yes, but was able to achieve some remarkable things. As commercial spaceflight becomes more commonplace in the future, which it certainly seems like, you know, as we've just discussed here, that that's likely going to be the trend. Are the first humans to Mars, they're probably going to still be highly trained NASA astronauts. But what is that path that you see towards having civilians going to Mars eventually? Like, is that something that you think is going to happen in our lifetime, potentially? I hope so. And I agree with that, your uh, statement. I think as much as over the last 10 years, we've heard a lot about one-way trips to Mars and things like that. I've never found that to be particularly realistic or practical because we still haven't figured out if we haven't been there. So we don't know for sure that we can live on Mars. So I think 100 people to Mars on the first trip is a sure recipe for 100 dead people on Mars. And we don't want that. (laughs) <laughs> that wouldn't be helpful to anybody. And so I think it is. We need to get the initial missions there, no matter who's doing it, and just literally figure out if we can live there. First off, just the basic stuff. Is there anything that we're not aware of that could kill us? <laughs> you know, something toxic. Can we actually grow crops on Mars? Can we? I mean, the MOXIE experiment that Janet mentioned, obviously that was the first ISRU test. But can we, on a sufficient scale, utilize the research to sustain the humans because it's, it, you know, take a lot, you know, not just 
using it for power, but if you're doing agriculture, that takes a lot of space and a lot of energy. And so how will this work and how can you manage things like in the soil, you have perchlorates, which are toxic to humans. So how are you going to be able to work with that environment? So you just have to figure these things out with the people you mentioned who are multi-talented, particular type of person who can do a lot of different things, think on their feet, lay the groundwork. So over time, as we start building up infrastructure, more ordinary people will come. So our goal is to have that day come where there are settlements on Mars and you don't have to be an astronaut or somebody on that caliber, you mean at least of expertise, but first you have to lay the groundwork to make sure that we can live on Mars. Absolutely. That's a very important piece of the puzzle. I want to also dive back into specifics around like the Humans to Mars Summit. So what makes this year extra special for Humans to Mars? And what can people who attend in person expect from this year's summit? Well, the first thing that I will say is it is our first in-person H2M since 2019, which is hard to believe for all of us, but we are so super excited that we will be actually in person. So that is probably what we're celebrating a lot is just finally, oh, I can actually see somebody and meet them in person, even though I may have only met them via Zoom. And as far as what you can expect, Chris is going to talk to you about the agenda, but I will tell you that what we try to do is create a really kind of intimate conference that there's somebody you really want to speak to, we can broker that and make sure that you get to speak to them. And I think that's what makes it so lovely is that if you come, we will do our best. If you say, I'd really like to speak to them, if it's possible, we will do our darndest to make that introduction and make sure you've had a chance to interact with those people that have really piqued your curiosity. Oh, I love that. That's really good to know that it's not only just there for, you know, obviously all the information, but yeah, the networking component is key as well, in addition to all the panels and discussions and things like that. We have a really good program coming together right now. As usual, we have senior NASA and industry folk, administrator of NASA, Bill Nelson, will be speaking on the first day. And, you know, we'll have great updates on mission architecture and science and all the usual big picture items of how we're going to get there and what we're looking for. But we have so much more. And this is where also going back to your initial question about educating the public. One of the things we always like to do is try to make this not just about the same echo chamber of people. Try to expand it every year, bring in non-traditional people, non-traditional industries to show this isn't just about a small group of aerospace companies, but it's so much bigger. That's really taken off over the last few years. So as I mentioned before, we'll have a lot of discussion on all these interesting innovations, 3D printing. We'll have one on food production. So we'll have people talking about cell-grown meat on Mars. And think about that, because, of course, we're not going to be, uh, presumably, not going to be bringing cattle to Mars anytime soon, probably not chickens either or fish. And so if you can actually just bring a few cells from each animal and then just create as much meat as you want without killing any animals also at, at the same time, is a wonderful resource, is transformative. And so we'll be talking about that and as well as medicine and human wellness on the surface, all the different elements on that. We have an expert from John Hopkins who's been working on this autonomous robotic surgery process, which could be extraordinarily important on Mars, but here on Earth as well. I think the last two years have shown us the importance of remote medicine and ways to improve how we're doing, as well as dealing with, of course, viruses and microbial life and things like that. So all these things are going to be discussed within the context of this conference. And this is what we always love, because it's not talk about the big picture stuff, but get down into all these interesting elements, which are not just a small group of rocket companies. This gets companies around the country and the world that are not specifically space companies, like they like with the lab grow meat company I was mentioning, Ala Farms. They're in Israel. They weren't founded to be a space exploration company. They were founded to create meat without killing animals. And they've done brilliantly, but they've also been engaging within the space community a lot in the last couple of years. 
So it's just wonderful to find all these and collaborate with all these innovators all around the world and also let introduce them to the prospects because some of them know that they have technologies that could be directly relevant to Mars. So that's one of the fun things to be able to let them know, invite them, and then they become part of our community. Yeah, absolutely. Well, it sounds like it's going to be pardon the pun, but a stellar agenda this year, for sure. (laughs) I had to, I had to. Um, I'm so glad you did. (laughs) (laughs) I know. People who are new to the space industry, I'm always like, there's no pun, there's no amount of space cheese that like we were just not here for. So I feel like space people just kind of love it. But no, I mean, the agenda sounds amazing. I'm really thrilled. I'm excited. You know, I was there in 2019, you know, obviously the last in-person event. So really excited for this to be in person again, just because, you know, it is such a great event for networking and for engaging with people. It's not impossible, but it's much more difficult to do that virtually. So why Washington, D.C.? What makes GWU and the nation's capital the perfect location for this event and conversations about humanity's future on Mars in general? Yeah, one (laughs) of the reasons that we like doing that is that at the conclusion of the summit on Friday, we actually kind of, if you Anybody out there want to help and go to Capitol Hill that we're going to deliver the Human to Mars report. And it's nice to be able to go there and share what we think can happen and what the benefits are about NASA keeping their plan to get humans to Mars. And that's one thing so that we're very close to the policymakers so that we can go and speak with them. And that's a powerful thing to be able to also get folks who are close to the NASA Washington office to get them to come and speak. Administrator Nelson is on our agenda and will be there on Tuesday to close out the day. Chris probably has some other reasons for it being in Washington. No, I think Janet explained it pretty well. I think having this conference in D.C. is very important because it just helps focus the policy, helps focus, you know, really engage the political policy folks, as well as being so close to NASA headquarters. I think it just really works well. And I think the Congress and the administration, everybody understands it's happening And it just helps focus the message uh, each year at a reliable time. And we always make, as Janet mentioned, get to the Hill. And there are often things that spin off from it. I mean, I remember one year where, you know, some of the speakers we had in town, you had congressional hearing was decided on Mars, popped up during it because of, you know, to take advantage of our speakers. Same year, the Washington Post did a side event, you know, talking about Mars as well. So it's just a great way to focus as long as we're doing it well, focus attention with all these key people. That said, we do want to start now, hopefully we'll be getting back to without interruption, I hope, in-person events. We will want to start doing things other places, West Coast, internationally. Well, not just the West Coast, anyways, other places around the country, but also go international again and start really expanding our footprint again and Yeah, they're expanding our message. Again, I'm just so excited about this year's event. And just a reminder to folks, it's not too late to get your tickets May 17th through the 19th for Humans to Mars Summit in Washington, D.C. Definitely highly recommend that anybody who's able can attend that. So I've got one last question here before our lightning round. And we ask this of everyone that comes on the show. But Celestial Citizen is all about the idea that humans can become not only better stewards of Earth, but also better interplanetary citizens. So in your opinion, what is one important way in which people can work toward becoming celestial citizens today? For me, the way that we become celestial citizens is that we start being the best crewmates here on earth. And it starts with compassion and kindness and understanding and inclusion and equity and justice and equality and those kinds of things. When we become each other's best crewmates here on spaceship earth, I think we will have it made being crewmates elsewhere. Astronaut Hoot Gibson was chief astronaut for quite some time after he was part of the space shuttle program. And he and his wife live here in Tennessee. And I had the occasion one time of going to lunch with him. And I was like, so tell me, uh, Hoot, what makes a great astronaut or, you know, what's really required? Is there anybody that you'd ever say no to? And 
He said, the biggest requirement is that you got to put the mission first. You got to put any kind of personal agendas, personal feelings, all of that aside. And all that's important is whatever is mission critical. And I was like, okay. And I said, and is there ever a person you wouldn't hire? And he said, the perfectionist. And I said, really? And he said, because he goes, I watched this guy one day train on the simulator and He was near perfect every time. Like we're talking near perfect, like every time. But the day that he wasn't perfect, he fell apart. And he goes, I can't have anybody falling apart in space. So I thought that was really profound stuff and a way longer answer than you asked for. (laughs) Yeah, from my perspective, it's this really is an international effort. And so often we work with people internationally all the time with all, all the different companies and space agencies work as one, not necessarily, you know, like they're working on behalf of a country and they often they are, but it just is a wonderful power that everybody has a unified purpose working together. And we go to, for instance, go send humans to Mars, that most likely will be an international mission. And if it is, it will be almost certainly the greatest peacetime, well, hopefully peacetime, peacetime, uh, international collaboration in human history, you know, just unifying the planet to go together. And I think that is powerful when we can just bring everybody together and everybody comes closer that we realize we're really not that different from each other. You know, we have some differences, of course, but all working together, it's amazing how quickly those differences disappear. Now, they never really materialize often because you're just working so close with somebody and you realize we all have the passion for this. We still want to achieve the same goals. And I, I think it just has a rem- rem- remarkable power. Well, I think that's a great outlook for the future and both very good reminders for our community as well. Okay. So now we are on to the lightning round of quick questions and you can feel free to just give like a word or two word answer to this. You don't even have to give an explanation as to why you picked what you did. Sometimes that's even funnier sometimes, but feel free if you want to give an explanation as well. Are you ready? Okay. Yes. I think I already know the answer to this one, but I'm going to ask it because we ask everyone. Would you rather live on the moon or Mars? Mars. Mars. (laughs) On Mars, your favorite space hobby would be what? Long jump. (laughs) Mine would be playing hide and go seek with my grandkids in lava tubes. Oh, oh, that's a fun one. I love a good lava tube. That's a good one. All right. (laughs) Um, <laughs> I love a good lava tube. Okay. We talk about on this podcast, or I've had so many people talk about lava tubes. I've done so, like in grad school, I did some research into it. So it's like, this is a very favorite topic on the show. But anyway, okay. Favorite astronaut. I'll be biased here. Um, Dr. Cyan Proctor. Ah, there you go. Astronaut Don Thomas, because he has spoken to more kids with me via Zoom during the pandemic and always gave freely of his time. Oh, that's so nice. Yeah. And I'm sure it's probably hard for you both to answer because you actually know multiple different astronauts. So it's probably (laughs) very challenging to answer that one. Yep. (laughs) Um, Okay. And I'm going to give you another tough one. You can only pick one of the following. Blue Origin, SpaceX, or Virgin Galactic. That's unfair. We have to approach all these folks for sponsorship and speakers. <laughs> That's right. You can pass. If you don't want to, you can pass. I'll pass. <laughs> right. I'm going to go with none of the above and say Axiom. <laughs> oh, all right. Uh-huh. Hey, there you go. There you go. Yeah. Well, and that's the exciting thing is like, you know, it used to be that there were just a few kind of really big brand name players, but now there's so many. So that list probably needs to expand. And I'll tell you why. Uh, uh, Peggy Whitson, astronaut Peggy Whitson, the most kind of like two time commander of the International Space Station. She works for Axiom. Mm, Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Okay, here's another tough one. I don't know. This one might be controversial, but maybe not. The Martian Interstellar or Contact. Interstellar. Oh, see, I was expecting both of you to go with the Martian, but oh, that's very interesting. No, oh, I'm not, it's not even, I'm not, not even biased there. I don't, I, most of the Mars movies I see, I think aren't very good, but I do prefer that one to those others. So I sort of love the psychology and philosophy of Interstellar. All three of those are high on my list, but Interstellar was one that I saw at just the right point in time in my life when I was like just starting to get really interested in space. So yeah, that one's got a special place for me. 
Okay, let's see. Permanently grounded on Earth or a one-way trip to Mars? One-way trip to Mars when I'm 80. Fair. Fair enough. That's actually a pretty good answer. I think I'll go with that one. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, that one is good. It is good. Um, It's like, what? I mean, it's like, it's a great question. You're, you know, somebody's asking your grandkids, where's your grandma? On Mars. I mean, there's just like, of all the ways that you could go, like going on Mars, like, yes, she's going to be there. We're going to see her maybe someday. (laughs) Oh, that's funny. Yeah. Got a nice retirement set up in uh, the, you know, Dallas Marineris. They're going to need somebody to like play hide and seek in the lava tubes. I'll be the perfect, I'll be the perfect granny Mars. (laughs) (laughs) Amazing. Amazing. Okay. Star Wars or Star Trek? Star Trek. Depends on my mood. (laughs) <laughs> but that's a toughie today i'll say star trek also i'm more in the star trek mood but it varies <laughs> fair enough fair enough okay will humans ever live beyond our solar system yes yes and let's say you're sent on a long duration mission what's more important choosing your crew choosing the food or choosing the destination crew yeah, I think the crew, food is the second because that, that's a key part, not just for eating, I mean, eating, but for mental health as well. But crew composition is the most important thing to not going insane or killing your fellow crew members. Very important. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> crew don't and want chocolate. That. I should have yeah. Oh, there you go. Yeah. <laughs> the rest can be algae, but as long as we get some chocolate, maybe. Okay. And last one. Finish this sentence. In 50 years, we'll all be what? In 50 years, we'll all be Martian. (laughs) Oh. (laughs) What's going to happen between now and then that we all all move to Mars? (laughs) Yeah, I'm not not telling. (laughs) (laughs) It's like, uh, 50 years, we'll all know somebody who lives on Mars. Oh, oh, oh. Like that. yeah, that's interesting. That's a All good right. one. All right. Such a great way to close out today's conversation. <laughs> so I'm going to go with that. All right. And thank you so much, Janet and Chris, for joining Celestial Citizen Podcast. It's been great having you both on the show and getting to chat more about the upcoming Humans to Mars Summit. And just as one more plug, I want to mention that this is actually really exciting, but in partnership with Explore Mars, Celestial Citizen is excited to announce that we'll be running a giveaway for five lucky individuals to attend this year's Humans to Mars Summit with free event passes. So be on the lookout for details about that on Instagram soon and go ahead and follow Explore Mars and Celestial Citizen while you're at it. Also, for those planning to attend, our team will be there capturing the spirit of the event through our media coverage. So stop by and say hello. Chris and Janet, thanks again. And if you'd still like to register, which there's plenty of time to do so, exploremars.org and that go down and say register for the summit. We'd love to have you. Amazing. And we will put that in the show notes as well. So you can just click right there, direct over to register for the summit. But yeah, Chris and Janet, thank you so much again for your time. And I'm looking forward to seeing you both in a few weeks. Thank you so much for having us. Three, two, one. We have liftoff. A particular little ship, my supersonic ship, set your disposal if you feel so inclined. All right. Go travel faster than light. That little Elon Musk will be left in the dust. So all right. Say all right. And to our community of celestial citizens. Thank you so much for tuning in to this episode of Celestial Citizen Podcast. This episode would not be possible without the terrific work of this show's editor, Victor Figueroa. Thank you, Victor. Also, a very special thank you to Graham Clark, who created the amazing intro and outro music for this podcast. If you're interested in learning more about Celestial Citizen, and I hope you are, then check out celestialcitizen.com. You can also follow along on Twitter at Celestial Citizen and Instagram at The Celestial Citizen. And be sure to sign up for the Celestial Citizen newsletter on Substack. 
You can find the link to all of this on our website. If you're interested in supporting the mission of Celestial Citizen, consider reaching out to learn more about opportunities to sponsor this podcast. A major component of Celestial Citizen is feedback and public participation. We want to hear what you have to say. So let us know what you think about humanity's future in space and what it should look like. Please share your voice and your unique perspective on social media or if you prefer, all of the Celestial Citizen articles can also be found on Medium. So drop a comment and join the conversation. If you love today's podcast, please have your friends and family subscribe on whatever device or platform you listen to podcasts on and leave a stellar review so others can get hooked as well. That's all for now, Celestial Citizens. I'll be back next week for another episode. In the meantime, Don't be afraid to take up space.